for your first time So what was I doing in 2003? Well, that was a very poignant year for me. Uh, of course, it was the year that I set up the record label. Um, prior to that, uh, I was sort of on the cusp of uh, realising, could I make music a career, you know? Um, was it possible I was working at a day job, I actually worked for a cable company, uh, building all the kind of uh, duct work and construction in the roads. Um, so I was working and I was making music and I was very fortunate in the job that I did that I had the opportunity to skive off or bunk off work all the time. That really gave me a head start in the studio. I'd go into work and then go straight to the studio, DJing in the evenings and the weekends. Um, and then I took the big plunge. I, I, I sold my house, I moved back to my mum's, mum and dad's place and we set up tour rooms. So that was the kind of, the, the bare bones of what I was doing in 2003. Music has always been an integral part of my life, you know. Uh, I suppose it emanates really from my dad, who was a drummer. He was in a band and they, uh, and they were fairly successful. They were signed to EMI and they toured and, and did all that. So I suppose inherently I always had that in me. And ever since I was a kid, I was mad passionate about buying music. Every penny I had was saved up for the weekend to go into town and go to Boots back then when they used to sell seven inches. And I, I honestly believe there is uh, there's someone very much to blame, for want of a better word, for how much musical output comes from Maidstone. There was a guy called Disco Gary and, and he used to put this event on called Kent Hall and every Monday night we all used to religiously go. Uh, when I say all, it was myself, uh, Dean Wilson, who's Dead Mouse's manager, Nick Fanciulli, Owen Ingram, some real key players in dance music. And this guy, Disco Gary, he used to play really upfront dance music. Now, he could have played anything. It was a school disco, effectively. Um, he used to play very early hip hop and that. And he, you know, he really instilled into people that you, know, you didn't have to listen to mainstream music. And I really think that influenced this massive scene or movement that's come out of Maystone. It, it's, it's kind of bizarre, really. This tiny little town has all of this going on. As Disco Gary has got a lot to say for how dance music has really flourished in Maidstone. What's my favourite touring record? I would say uh, Hall and Brookheimer in the beginning uh, that myself and Martin made. I mean, it was uh, it was really cool when we mixed the uh, when I mixed the ten album. You know, to go back and go over some of them records. And there's been some great records in the past, but that one just sounded as fresh as the day we made it, and it was it was great because that was another record that really puts on the map. Great to hear when you know you were just up and coming, and Pete Tom would play out on the radio on a Friday night. You'd be buzzing uh, and that was one of those records people hammered it in Ibiza and um, yeah that stand out for me. I never looked to, to have a production par uh, partner but it sort of just fell into place you know and I think what's very important when you, when you got to spend 18 hours a day in the studio with someone is friendships you know and I think that's what comes first if you're friends with someone and you think you know we could really go in and say something it's about creating a sound you know that's very important um, and that's pivotal in the, the record label success you know and I've said it many times before it's every great record label has a sound and it's a case as the label boss of, of putting all those people together to make collectively a musical statement to create this friend and family type arrangement and I think people like that you know people will like the fact that we're all mates we all hang out together we all make music together and that, that, that creates a kind of real buzz so it's about defining uh, which artists will stand for what you want to say and just working with your friends and you put all that in the mix and it, it, it's a magic formula. <laughs> What characterizes Mark Knight production? Well, first and foremost, I spent a lot of time uh, refining and honing a sound, you know? I think it's, it's key to obtain that first. I think a lot of producers flip from trends too quickly before they've established their own sort of defining sound. Once you've done that, I think then you've got free range to be a bit more creative. And I'm kind of at the point in my career now where I can be more creative, you know, and do things I love doing. You know, whether it be a remix for Submotion Orchestra at 120 BPM or, or working with Sander and uh, Underworld on 10, you know, I, I've afforded myself the opportunity to, to be uh, 
have a, a wider breadth of, of, of musical output. But what I try to do uh, is underpin it with that original sound and thing that I created, you know, because you can always go back to that. You can always use that as a template and then apply a different genre within that, if that sort of makes sense, you know. Um, and I always try to underpin it with soulful tones because that's very much where I'm from. So whether it be a sort of techno record or, or, or a, a sort of garage record, it, I want to put that feel in there, you know, because that, that says me. But it's all based around that original thing that I, I worked for years on to kind of create, and that's, you know, my own sound. I think the record I'm most proud of and the record that took the longest to make was probably uh, is Downpipe, you know, I think that's, you know, the record I want to be remembered by. And I think it's important, you know, when you make a record uh, in this age to do something that has a bit of longevity, you know, it's, it's so disposable anyway, this music. It's, I think we all have a responsibility of producers to, to you know, to do something that is a legacy of, of what you're about. And, Downpipe for me is that record. I mean, it took me and Dean a year to make that record. You know, we were literally giving up on it at stages, losing our hair. It was uh, it was hardcore, but it was worth it. You know, we knew the idea was right. We just had to graft it out. And I think too many people put too much emphasis on, oh yeah, I've got to do it in a week. It doesn't matter how long you take to make a record. No one has got a gun against your head saying you need to make it. You know, you might finish a record when it when it's right and when it's finished, and you cannot get another two percent out of it. And I think. That record for me epitomises that kind of mindset of you know of, of grafting it out and making records work, and it's the proudest you know it's the record I'm the most proud of, for sure. Why should someone buy the Tour Ten album? Well, you know, it's a great snapshot of the last 10 years. You know, some really big records in there, some moments, you know, that hopefully it will resurrect those thoughts. Oh, I remember when I did, oh, that record, I heard that one there. That's the kind of album we're trying to put together. And uh, I'm actually working on a new project now uh, on the screen behind me that I hope to get finished and released within uh, the 10 campaign. Also, we're going to revisit some of uh, the biggest records we've ever put out. We're going to remix Downpipe. We're going to remix Man With The Red Face. So look out for new versions of that. Um, and also, you know, me aside, I'm going to put a lot of effort into promoting new talent because that's important. As I said previously, it's about what we're going to do for the next 10 years, what we're doing looking forward. And there's going to be a big emphasis on, on the artists that we're going to focus on for the next 10 years of touring. So look out for that. <laughs>